Okay, hello again, everyone. We're going to talk in this episode about common genres of rhetorical writing found in AP language and composition. And I know that sounds uh, boring and not essential for success in this class, but I'm telling you right now, it's uh, this is something that I felt was valuable enough to devote an entire um, episode, I don't know what to call these, I guess, episodes, lessons, who knows. Uh, for now, I'm calling them episodes, but this is something that I felt was important enough to devote an entire early episode to. This shouldn't take too long. This should take uh, 10, 15 minutes. I mean, you'll be able to see while you're watching this how long it is, but I wanted to focus on the different uh, contexts or genres of rhetorical writing found in this class. Uh, in your prior English classes, the common genres you have been reading have probably fallen into three, maybe four categories. You've probably read novels slash nonfiction books or short and short stories, you've probably read poetry, and you've probably read plays. So very little of that will be read in this class traditionally, depending on who is teaching it. But if the person teaching it is doing it responsibly and trying to prepare you for the test, they will be teaching you things that you're probably not used to reading because these are texts that where people are using rhetoric and rhetoric is advanced. And so to succeed in analyzing it, it helps to understand the context. It helps understand a lot of things, but context is something that I, I definitely took for granted the first year I taught this class. And I think I did a better job last year making sure students understood the importance of that context. So before we even get to the analyzation of rhetoric, let's, let's talk about that context. Uh, I, I think I've already made it abundantly cl clear why it's important. The better you understand that context of the in which the rhetorical choices are made, the better you will be able to analyze them. I'm also going to obviously link to these notes in the video. And within these notes, I'm going to provide you different websites that will give you primary sources uh, for the type of rhetoric that is traditionally read in this class. I've, I go to these websites a lot when I want to make my own practice uh, prompts and activities for this class. Very valuable, very easy, and it's it's truly interesting if you're in a, a rhetoric mood. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to do these, wait, before I get there, how do you convince someone? Like we said in our previous episode, we use a mix of emotion, a mix of logic, and if applicable, we appeal to our own authority as we try to convince someone, which is what rhetoric is about, achieving our purpose, which often involves changing a person's mind. So we appeal to the emotions, the logic of the audience, and sometimes we use our own authority on the matter to convince that person. We're not gonna use the fancy Greek words. We're gonna use the more plain spoken, the more Ple plebeian words, right? Understanding the context is extremely important. I've, I've said that enough. Let's move forward. I'm going to do this in order of uh, prevalence in the rhetorical analysis essay and also just what you will, yeah, what you will be exposed to uh, the most on the test. So for RA, it's Seven, 60, 65, 70% are going to be some form of a speech carefully written for an audience of spectators, sometimes extending to TV and radio, meaning that the people who are viewing this speech aren't just people sitting in the immediate audience. They might, if the speech is 21st century or 20th century, the speech might extend to an even wider audience because it's being televised or put on the radio. Uh, so you have political speeches, obviously given by politicians or by somebody with some sort of um, explicit political motive. You also have eulogies, which 
are speeches given at a funeral to honor someone who died. I mean, that's the occasion of a funeral. Someone has died. Uh, commencement addresses are very popular in this class. And they've, in the past, if you look at the past tests from uh, Lang, there have been a number of commencement addresses that have been put up for students to analyze. Uh, and what that is, is the keynote address at a college graduation traditionally. I don't know if there's any other type of commencement address. I think it's just for college. Uh, maybe high school, I guess you'd call that a commencement address. I don't know. It's generally almost always at a college and generally at a famous fancy college because they can afford or they have the clout to get important famous speakers who give these very um, inspiring speeches. And they're inspiring because the person is famous and they've achieved a lot in some way or another. So I give links. These are all hyperlinked to different resources for famous eulogies, famous commencement addresses. The commencement address, I've actually found an article in Teen Vogue that had some good uh, things about it. Teen Vogue actually did some reporting on the Lang test in the spring about rampant cheating on, I think, the Calc test. They were the ones <laughs> doing the hard-hitting journalism, so good for Teen Vogue. Uh, political speeches takes you to AmericanRhetoric.com. I just a very, I, I love the website because of how just clear cut and unfrilly it is. Uh, by the way, my slides, if you haven't noticed, I, I try to make it as straightforward as possible and to the point where some say it looks just unsightly. They've been called prison slides before just because of how bare bones and and, and basic for lack of a better word, they are. But I do that intentionally. I know there's ways to customize it, make them look fancier, but I think this content deserves to be presented in a very straightforward manner. So that's why I do that. Uh, so rounding out other types of common speeches that you might see in this class are sermons. And while you know there are thousands of sermons given every Sunday, even today, the sermons that you're going to be looking at in Lang will almost always be pre 20th century and usually uh, 17th century. I mean, the most famous one is the Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God sermon by uh, Jonathan Edwards. He has a lot of very rhetorically rich uh, sermons that also have a good intertwining with American history uh, as well, if you're studying the Great Awakening in. AP US or in your regular history class. Uh, so what I'm getting at is if you're going to be analyzing sermons and you want to do it to help your success in the class, you, you do well to look at the older sermons from the earlier part of our country. Like by early, I mean pre-revolutionary war sermons. And I found a website that had uh, some of those and it was just a great awakening website. So it just takes you to some of those uh, sermons that you could look at. Okay, the second most popular form of the rhetorical address that's used in this class and on the test are letters. And they're usually old because no one writes letters anymore, like physical letters. I've never seen an email used for a rhetorical analysis before, uh, but I'm sure there's always a first, but it's usually letters because very few people, you don't sit down and, and carefully compose an email. And even if you do, it's not a long email. Back in the day when people wrote letters, it was their only form of communication. So they spent a lot of time doing it and they did it often. So they were good at it. Uh, so there's lots of fascinating letters from history that we can read and pick apart the language that's being used and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, so generally they're 20th and pre 20th century, like I said, uh, this is a really cool website, lettersofnote.com, and it used to be just a regular old blog that would, this guy would find very, like the website says, noteworthy letters from famous people or uh, sometimes not even famous people, but regarding interesting situations, and he would provide some commentary, then provide a transcript of the letter, and then uh, also photographs of the letter. And it's, it's now like a coffee table book, and I don't think he posts much anymore. But all the letters are still available to look at, and I really 
really, I go to this website a lot when I'm trying to, when I want maybe a quick activity to do as a warm up to look at the one that I started off with in this class that always endlessly fascinates me. They have a memo, which is a type of letter, like a memorandum that was sent in 1969 from Nixon's head speech writer. And it was a, a con they were trying to draft a speech in the event that the astronauts on Apollo 11 got stranded on the moon. If Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin got stuck there, they wrote a, a draft of a speech um, to be read by Nixon in the event that that happened. And it was never written, but it's fascinating to look at how it's the, the language that's used in that. It's actually, I was ahead of the curve with that letter. It's now made it into certain textbooks uh, as just a very interesting and unusual letter. But anyway, I could keep going on about letters and note, but civil war letters, I, I wanted to actually try that this spring and COVID kind of didn't give me enough time to jump into that. But there's there a lot of interesting people writing back to their family before they got uh, killed on the front lines. And it's worth looking into some of those if you want to see different perspectives. Generally, I think the union were the union soldiers were a little more literate, uh, not as many Confederate letters, probably also do the fact that just union won. So their materials probably survived better than the Confederates as well. And then there's other primary source collections. This website, I believe, has transcripts for the letters. A lot of them, it's tough. You can find cool letters from history, but they don't provide a transcript. And unless you can read this really fancy, ornate handwriting, it's kind of just something pretty to look at, but you can't read it. So really value the websites that will provide you a transcript in addition to a picture of the letter. Uh, okay, so... And a lot of times something to uh, note about a letter writing as far as analyzing it, a lot of times it is intimate. It is uh, a person communicating with another person and it's an intimate exchange of ideas as opposed to a very public exchange of ideas and trying to convince a large group. The audience is small. It's one person a lot of times or a family. It's one person writing a letter to one person as opposed to an open letter. And that's an important thing to note. If you look at a rhetorical analysis and it says that this was an open letter, that makes it completely different from a regular plain old letter because an open letter is meant for everyone to read. It's traditionally published uh, by the media. And generally an open letter is written by someone of note because otherwise the media wouldn't take the time. Like there's, you and I could write an open letter and mail it to the New York Times or our local newspaper, and they probably wouldn't uh, agree to publish it. You could write a letter to the editor, but that's a little different. An open letter is uh, a little more uh, boisterous and a little more attention getting. Uh, and yeah, like I noted here, often done by a person of significance because that's the only way the media is going to agree to publish it. The by far the most famous open letter in American history is letter from a Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King Jr. And your teacher's doing you a disservice if you don't read this in your class. I mean, aside from its uh, historical importance, aside from its contemporary relevance right now, I mean, it's, it's had a just a lasting importance throughout American history uh, from like a, a moral perspective, but from the, the, from the perspective of the aims of this class, letter from a Birmingham jail has everything you need to learn about rhetoric in it. It's by, by the standards of a letter, it's long. Like it's, I think like 5,000, 6,000 words, which comes out to around maybe 12 pages if you printed it all out, but there's not really a wasted word in it. And it's, uh, extremely when you, when you talk about that balance of emotion and logic and authority king does it all and he does it masterfully and he does it convincingly to where if you read it and you don't end up agreeing with them there's probably <laughs> something deeply wrong with you right i also link to uh, a website that gives you six important open letters from mentalfloss.com and I wasn't familiar with a lot of them, but I did find it interesting, the uh, the situations where people were choosing to write open letters in those. There's a British one that I wasn't familiar with where they were protesting um, 
an unpopular war. And the person was, I think it was World War One, and he wrote an open letter saying he would never fight anymore. And they locked him up in the insane asylum for not wanting to fight. So that was interesting. I might use that in class. So a popular uh, type of writing, rhetorical writing that you will be exposed to a lot in AP Lang are newspaper columns. And I had this kind of closer to the end, but then I bumped it up because it's certainly a very popular method of writing to teach and to assign projects based around newspaper column, columns, excuse me. And the important thing to know about them is that a column is written by somebody who's hired by a, the newspaper um, because they're, they're good enough at writing, they're smart enough, and their opinions are interesting enough and cogently expressed well enough for them to be paid a salary to weekly sometimes most i think like david brooks and the new york times people write two a week and they have to find a topic or a political issue and express their opinion uh, about how the president is right or the president is wrong or this bill should be passed or this bill should not be passed there was i think it was thomas friedman for the new york times he'd travel a lot and he'd write about what he saw in the world and how it reflected global politics etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's that's why a lot of times teachers will assign projects where you have to read a columnist for six weeks or so and write about uh, the rhetoric used by that columnist to achieve his or her purpose. I put down some of the famous ones. I should probably go through and link you to their writing. I tried to have a mix of conservative and progressive. Uh, it's tough to find like moderate conservative Columnists George Will and David Brooks, I think, are some of the few. I don't. I don't even know if George Will is considered moderate conservative anymore. I don't know what he is. He's kind of just a pedant. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates is very famous essayist. He writes for the Atlantic, uh, which is a magazine, but he's kind of a cross between a columnist and he. I guess technically he's a blogger, but he, in terms of contemporary relevance. He kind of reigns over the rest of these people. Uh, his book, Between the World and Me, is very, like, that's one of the most important collections of uh, essays uh, from the past decade and, or from the prior decade, rather. And uh, what I'm getting at is he fits into this group, um, writing a column, writing their opinions on a weekly basis for a publication. Make sense? Good. Uh, so aside from that, very popular form are essays. And those are published in magazines, newspapers, literary journals. Sometimes they're done by a professional writer. Sometimes they're done by a civilian like you or I, you or me, writing about a topic we're passionate about and carefully, carefully written. Uh, and if you, when you read these, it's very important to note the specificity of the publication uh, because that can indicate who the audience is and that affects the choices made by the writer. So for example, uh, I need to actually fix the capitalization in this. Give me one sec. It's unsafe for teens to play football in high school. So let's just say that's the title of uh, an essay. And so the audience reading it is gonna be very different if it's published in Scientific American like obviously a science research-based publication than if it were published on ESPN.com, right? Scientific American, as the title indicates, academic. Uh, it's not a journal per se, but it is. It would have a much more scholarly audience and a smaller audience than ESPN would. So when you're the, knowing where uh, an essay is published, is valuable information for figuring out and analyzing the rhetoric used in that essay. Okay, uh, then we have press conferences and news conferences uh, where a person of note takes questions from the media and sometimes gives a speech. Not seen very often. Uh, however, there's a uh, an, a rhetorical analysis from like, I don't know, 20, 2012, 2013, where Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, is giving a 
press conference uh, about the steel union at the time, uh, like raising prices. Uh, I forget the context. I, I link you to the release test right there and it's on page 10. And when I gave it, I had a lot of students who claimed they didn't know what a press conference was and that screwed up their ability to give good analysis. And so I am correcting that by now explaining to you what a press conference is. And I'm not laughing at them not knowing it. It's just, uh, I don't know, I guess it is kind of funny to me that somebody wouldn't know what a press conference is, but we, we live in a different world. I don't know. Do we live in that different world? Hopefully you know what a press conference is. Uh, the, the, the key part of it is the media is there listening and they're going to report what is said to the world. A lot of press conferences like political press conferences, the president talks at a press conference, it's broadcast to the world. And if the media is there, what you say is going to be disseminated to an even wider audience. That's the important thing to know. Uh, and then a few less commonly seen, but worth knowing types of genres of rhetoric, book introductions. It's starting to be a little more common for book introductions to be used on the test or on multiple choice passages. Uh, so they're often trying to place the book in a new context if the book is old or being republished or revisited or argue how the book should be appreciated. Uh, sometimes the introduction is written by the author. Sometimes the intro is written by somebody who knew the author or a scholar on the subject. It's, it's a tough that I think that's one of the toughest uh, types of rhetoric to analyze as a book introduction, in my opinion. And then press releases, which I might dabble in a little bit this year if I have time. That's where a company or a politician or someone of note issues an announcement to the media. This is something that I'll bet if I gave, if I made that my first time to write a press release, a lot of people would be very frustrated because I don't feel like that's something the average junior in high school would be able to explain clearly what it is, even though really what you need to know, press release, all it is, is a statement that is released to the press, the media. Uh, it's often meant to put a positive spin on negative news. And in famously press releases, a lot of the, the ones that are expressing negative news happen on Friday. It's called a, a media like you like dump all your bad news on Friday because people are excited for the weekend and the bad news doesn't really sustain itself throughout the work week when people are paying attention to the news. Uh, important thing to note about a press release though, is it's going to be done by a company of note or a person of note. If I sent a press release uh, to the local newspaper or to the New York times saying that, um, I am quitting my job or something like that, they would obviously not publish it because I am not worth them disseminating that in information to a large audience. But a politician or a huge uh, company, that would be somebody that they would probably consider uh, spreading that information. Made less prevalent over the past decade by Twitter and other social media. So I don't even know if companies are still issuing press releases if they have millions of followers on Twitter, they can, a lot of reporting now by newspapers is just <laughs> kind of repackaging tweets that are done by politicians and companies just kind of saying, and you see that with athletics as well. Athletes see, I just watched the Jordan documentary and Michael Jordan, when he returned from his hiatus, when he played baseball, when he returned, he issued a press release that just simply said to the media, I'm back. Um, these days, if that were to happen today, an athlete would just tweet that they wouldn't bother like having their agent write a statement for the media. So if you see a press release, it's probably going to be on the older side. But now that you've watched this and now that we've talked about it, you know what it is and you're better for it and you're going to do better in this class for it. Uh, I guess I should have mentioned as well. This would probably be the type of video that would help to keep some form of notes to go back over or maybe just watch this video again before a timed write if you're doing rhetorical analysis, just so you remember the important salient features of each one of these types of uh, rhetorical genres.
So I think I've made it as clear as I can how important it is to understand the subtlety of these modes. I'm not gonna mix up terminology. I'm gonna correct that. We're gonna say genres. Uh, the better you'll be able to analyze the choices of the speaker. And that brings us finally to the nuts and bolts of analysis, of rhetorical analysis, which you can do a lot of different ways, but starting last year, the acronym SpaceCat became a handy way of categorizing the, the most important things to note when trying to construct an analysis of a piece of rhetoric. So in the next episode, lesson, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to delve into what SpaceCat is, why it's important, and how to apply it to a piece of rhetoric. So thanks for watching. I will see you uh, next time.